Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I've got another PhD in biology who is not convinced that evolution is real. Who knew there were so many of them? There's got to be like, what, 20 to 30 of them out of the millions of PhD holders in the world with something like 12,000 new life science PhDs every year? These creationist PhDs are going to outnumber the non-creationist ones if this keeps up. Oh wait, maybe it's just that people with doctorates are normal people and you can find quacks in any field no matter how well educated. Oh yeah, and also, long video, lots of filler, I'll be skipping, check original, make sure I'm not being dishonest, same old, same old. Let's see how this guy does. Welcome to The Creator Revealed. I'm Tim Standish, I'm a scientist, but I'm also a Christian, and there really shouldn't be a but in there. <laughs> of course, scientists can and in fact should be Christians. That means that I believe the biblical record of history. Oh, there is so much wrong in this one short statement. Yes, scientists can be Christian, and a lot are, and that's okay. But to say that scientists should be Christian is a touch on the problematic side. Whether or not you believe someone is listening when you talk to yourself should not be a qualifier when you are researching how the world actually works. And specifically, who you think is the one listening should also have no bearing on it. And that's ignoring the glaring error that being a Christian does not mean that you have to read Genesis as a literal history. There are plenty of Christians who accept it as metaphorical, and I dare say they make better scientists than you do. I mean, I doubt you're much of a scientist, as a search for your name in PubMed brings back two results from 2004, neither of which have you as the primary author. PubMed searches across more than 30,000 scientific journals dealing with life sciences. If you can't be found there, you must not be doing much. Just having the letters PhD after your name does not automatically make you a scientist. You have to actually do something with them. Blogging for a creationist organization does not count as science. So, let's start off here. This is well, actually one of my favorite places. It's south of Sydney in Australia, a place called Coal Cliff, and you can see yeah. why. Yes, Can you see that, that beautiful line of coal there? This is why Australia is the Saudi Arabia of coal. Ouch. I wouldn't want my country to be called the Saudi Arabia of anything. Although, fun fact, if you Google Saudi Arabia of coal, you won't find anyone referring to Australia. That particular title seems to be reserved for the United States. There's huge amounts of coal there in this, in this basin around Sydney. And uh, here's the thing. Do you see what a straight line that is between the coal and the, and the sandstone that's on top of it? Yes. Hmm. When you do something called radiometric dating, what you find out is that supposedly there was five million years that that coal was on top of the earth and then the sandstone came along and piled up on top of it. Nope, that is not what you find with radiometric dating. Coal can sometimes be dated radiometrically depending on the type of coal, but this is not a direct dating method. The coal bed in the Sydney Basin has been dated using relative dating methods to the Permian period. Within the coal bed are several tufts, that is, deposits of volcanic ash. Zircon crystals from within the tufts can then be dated using uranium lead dating, which gives us an absolute age for the tufts themselves. These ages have agreed with the relative dating methods used to date the coal beds beforehand. There are different methods of dating the sandstone layers, and I'm not sure which methods were used on that particular sandstone, but one method is to find the youngest zircon crystal. Sandstone, since it is sedimentary, cannot be older than its youngest zircon. Layers of volcanic ash can also be used, as was done with the coal bed. Index fossils can be used as well. But here, let's just agree, there's a 5 million year unconformity between the coal and the sandstone. That is, the coal is 5 million years older than the sandstone, and there is no strata from the time between the coal and the sandstone. Does that mean the coal had to be exposed on the surface of the earth for 5 million years before the sandstone was deposited? No, it does not. There are a few ways unconformities can form. Certainly, it is possible that the older layer of the unconformity was exposed for a significant amount of time and there were just no depositional events. That does happen. There isn't deposition going on everywhere on the Earth all the time. But it could also be that whatever layers were deposited above the coal were eroded before the deposition of the sandstone. This is five million years we're talking about here. A lot can happen in five million years. 
Or nothing could have happened. Well, I mean, obviously something happened. I just mean nothing geological. So there's a kind of logic here. We're looking at two different clocks and they're telling us different times um, at this place called Colcliffe. First of all, there's that radiometric clock and that says five million years, but the flat interface between the layers says a short period of time. Wait, are you saying that the coal has been radiometrically dated as being five million years old or that there's a missing five million years between the layers? Because if I looked into the same coal bed that you're talking about, which I think I did, then it's coal from the Permian period. That's 251 million year old coal at a minimum. These flat gaps in time that we see uh, there, they're actually quite common. Yes, that's correct. They are not uncommon. And do you know what? James Hutton, the geologist who was of the opinion that a deistic benevolent designer was responsible for creating life on Earth, used unconformities as conclusive evidence in favor of deep time and tectonic activity. I count this as a biological evidence because... Because you, as a biologist, don't know that the study of rocks is called geology? Or maybe you do, you just want to come up with a reason why you actually do know what you're talking about when it comes to geology, even though you clearly don't. Because coal came from plants. Ah, I see. Coal came from plants, and plants are biology. Great. I guess that means you're also an expert in paleontology, too, since fossils came from animals. And you must be an expert jeweler as well, since diamonds come from coal, which comes from plants. Sorry, but no, you do not get to claim expertise in a field just because there's a little bit of overlap. This does not make someone an expert in both fields if they have expertise in just one of the two overlapping fields. So let's look at another thing. Here's, here's our coal again. This is just looking at the same coal from a different angle. And when we, when we look at that coal, um, frequently you find carbon-14 in coal. Maybe you do find it in there, but you definitely do not use carbon-14 to date the coal. Maybe you should just stick to biology instead of pretending that geology is biology because coal came from plants or whatever, because you're clearly beyond your depth. Now, you've all heard that carbon-14 means long ages, but that's actually not really true. Is this from, where they get the carbon dating Yeah, from? this is what carbon dating comes from. The, the, the most ancient carbon-14 dates that you can possibly get are around 100,000 years. There are some variables in there, You're generally less than that, and a lot less. Stop. Stop it right now. You're not helping anyone. You are setting your followers up for abject failure if they ever actually talk to someone who knows even the slightest bit of information about geology. Nobody is trying to hide the fact that C14 dating is generally used on specimens that are less than 50,000 years old. If you just go as far as the Wikipedia page for carbon dating, you'll see right at the top of the page the part where it says the oldest dates that can be reliably measured by this process date to around 50,000 years. Now, under special circumstances, yes, it can be used up to a maximum of 100,000 years, but that's not the norm. You're setting your people up for embarrassment as soon as they meet someone who knows to say, well, yeah, but we have uranium lead, potassium argon, rubidium strontium, uranium thorium, and others for different timescales. Now, I'm skipping the bit about dinosaur soft tissue because this is a long one and I don't feel like getting into it right now. It's a topic that's been covered to death. I have other videos on it, Polygia has videos on it, Stated Clearly has videos on it, and a bunch of other people also have videos on it. But I suppose that if that really were one of my criteria for skipping a creationist bit, I wouldn't make any more YouTube videos since they very rarely come up with anything genuinely new. So I guess just chalk this one up to I'm not feeling it right now. It's not that technical, but mutations, these are random changes in DNA sequences. Most, most of these changes have a very small impact, thankfully, or we'd all be dead, and you're going to see why. <laughs> so I would just like to make sure that we keep this slide up for long enough to actually read it. Most mutations have a negative impact on fitness, the most common are near-neutral mutations which have a very small negative impact on fitness, and mutations that have a positive impact on fitness are rare. Did you guys catch the sneaky little lie in there? He takes the massive category of mutations which are completely neutral and don't do anything harmful or helpful, and rename them near neutral and claim that they do have a very small negative impact. 
I've never seen anyone do this before, and if I were to guess, I would think that this is his response to the fact, yes, fact, it is an observed fact, that beneficial mutations are real and do happen. Because if beneficial mutations are real and the vast majority of mutations are neutral, then this allows for natural selection to slowly cull out the negative mutations while favoring the positive mutations. And he knows this because he is actually a qualified biologist, so he had to find a way to spin it to make it look like he's not just going to be flat out lying. In just a moment. Let's imagine that we have a wife and a husband and they have a whole bunch of children. In fact, they have 10 children. And let's just imagine that there is a very low mutation rate, 1.1, I'm sorry, per per mu 0.1 mutations per individual per generation. That would mean that one of their children had a mutation. Now you'd think, okay, natural selection can get rid of that child and the rest of them will be perfectly fine. What are you even talking about? That is not how natural selection or mutations work. Everybody has mutations. They happen all the time. Mutations are not an automatic death sentence and nobody is claiming that they are. But what would happen if you had a higher mutation rate? Let's say 0.5 mutations per generation. Well, that would mean five out of the 10, half of them would not survive if natural selection selected them out, but you'd still have five, so you'd be fine. But what if you had one mutation per individual per generation? It wouldn't exactly be like this, but we're just illustrating something here. No, you're right. It wouldn't be exactly like this. It wouldn't even be close to this. This doesn't even approach analogous. And you know better. This is one of the cases where I'm comfortable stating that this person is not ignorant or mistaken, but is actually lying. I doubt it's possible to become as highly educated in biology as this person is without completely understanding why this visualization that he is giving here is completely 100% inaccurate. This is a pandering lie that is relying on the ignorance of his audience. That would, in this example, mean absolutely all of your children had mutations and natural selection would not be capable of getting rid of them. So what is the actual human mutation rate? You know, is it, is one. it one mutation per individual per generation or 0.1? What, what is it exactly? Well, there are lots of estimates about this, but generally speaking, there are well over 100 mutations <laughs> per individual <laughs> per generation. Which demonstrates exactly why your little example there isn't even close to being accurate. Is this supposed to be an argument against the general principle of natural selection that is so obvious that even most creationists have to accept it and find ways to force it into the worldview? The, the point is this. Human beings are incapable of even having enough babies to get rid of all of these mutations. So That's not how numbers work. Natural selection is not only improbable, it sounds impossible. Well, natural selection isn't going to fix this problem. Yeah. You know, we're going to accumulate mutations. Now, thankfully, our bodies are so robust that we can survive a whole bunch of mutations. Or maybe, just maybe, you were lying when you labeled most mutations as slightly negative, and it is the case that most mutations are completely neutral and don't do anything positive or negative. It's not about how many mutations you can survive, it's about what those mutations do. And even if they were slightly negative, the way mutations are passed down would mitigate their negative effects. Not all the children of a mutated parent will share the mutation, so if there is indeed a negative effect, then the children who do not share the mutation will have better reproductive success than the ones who do. Add an occasional beneficial mutation into the mix, and boom, evolution. But the question then becomes, how many mutations can we survive? Plenty, especially since most of them do nothing. At what point are we going to, to, to die because we simply, our, 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 our genomes are worn out? Okay, so was that whole thing supposed to be a demonstration of the concept of genetic entropy, which isn't actually a thing? And truthfully, we don't know exactly but we could be pretty sure that it isn't millions of years. Are we pretty sure? Here's the thing. One of the arguments that I have seen creationists use time and time again is that we breed things like bacteria in a lab for thousands to millions of generations, and, shocker, they're still bacteria. 
and then they complain that even if we do see changes, it's because we artificially sped up the mutation rate. But if genetic entropy is really a thing, then speeding up the mutation rate should wipe them out faster, should it not? Even just moving up to small mammals, rabbits can reproduce every year. If they lost just 0.1% of their genetic fitness with every generation, then in the 3,000 years since the flood, they should be down to about 5% of their immediate post-flood genetic fitness, right? So where are the ancient super rabbits? All signs point to rabbits being pretty much the same as they are now for the last several thousand years. If genetic entropy is real, then these organisms with fast reproductive times should either be much worse off than they are today, or should show signs of having been significantly better than they were in the past. His mercy is clear in not allowing sin and suffering to have continued over yes. hundreds of millions of years in the past. So we can praise God. The time is short. All right, normally I skip the preachy stuff, but I just want to point out that this statement came pretty shortly after they started talking about having to read to the end of the Bible and alluding to the apocalypse. So they are saying here that God's mercy is evident because this cruel shithole of a world that he created will only last a few thousand years instead of a few million. So God is wonderful and merciful because he'll put us out of our misery and send most of us to an eternal torture chamber. Because an eternity of torture is more merciful than millions of years of individuals suffering for a little bit before ceasing to exist entirely. They spend the rest of the video discussing molecules that have survived for millions of years that supposedly shouldn't have, and they seem to be going about it on a different track than just the typical dinosaur soft tissue thing, so I might cover that in a follow-up. But for now, that's a pretty big topic shift, and it seems like a good place to leave it. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Gary Avey, who says, Even a child could tell you that man did not evolve. You only need special credential to show what a Muppet you are, and show me one fact that anything evolved. Firstly, Children can tell you all sorts of things. How does an acorn turn into an oak tree? Because it opens up its hat and shrinks a squirrel, eats it up, and then it turns into a giant acorn. And that's where it old trees come from. What a child can tell you is not relevant when discussing what is real. And if it were, I'd know of at least three that can tell you that we did evolve. In fact, Grandmother Fish is one of their favorite books. Now, as to one fact that anything evolved, I've got more than one, so here we go. Citrate metabolizing E. coli. Eleven broken copies of an identical gene found throughout our genome, which can also be found in a chimp's genome in the exact same places. Fuse chromosome 2. Antibiotic-resistant bacteria the hominid transitional fossils, the cetacean transitional fossils, other transitional fossils, atavisms, vestigial structures, homologous structures, biogeography predicted by evolution, molecular clock dating using neutral mutations, the phylogenetic tree, how well Linnaean phylogeny matches up with molecular phylogeny. Human embryos have extra hand muscles that are found in lizards but not in adult humans. Dolphin embryos start with the nostrils on the front of their face, which then migrate up to the top of their head as the embryo develops. I could go on, but that would be a whole video in and of itself of just me listing facts that demonstrate evolution. So that's where I'm going to leave it. Shout out to TJ once again for sending me a nice little gift basket which included a book for the kids and an iPhone 6. You may remember TJ from the time he sent me a Drobo fully loaded with hard drives, which I now use to archive my channel. And uh, no, this is not TJ the Amazing Atheist. And also another shout out to J.R. Eldridge, author of the hilarious Misread Bible Genesis, who has now sent me his new book, A Misread Bible Christmas. That's it for today. Links to social media accounts can be found in the description, and if you want access to my videos a day early, consider becoming a patron. See you next time! This is Vice Rhino's daughter, letting you know that we did, in fact, involve from filthy monkey men. See, even a child can tell you that.